Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you all so much for joining me for the webinar today. My name is Grace Beck and I I have been with Rio Sense for about 11 years now. Uh, formally, I am the operations manager, but many of you who have signed up for the webinar and are also on the call um, are probably familiar with me uh, also sending many emails um, when it comes to customer service and just overall um, kind of some care emails. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for joining me today, especially in the US, uh, as I am aware that there is a holiday tomorrow. Um, so thank you all so much for taking the time. Um, we did kind of publish this webinar as stating that it will be the shortest webinar that you have ever been in. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, this webinar will be recorded. So if you do want a copy of the recording, uh, please give us about one to two business days and we will make sure that the recording is sent to everyone who has signed up. And if you do not get that email, you can always reach out to us directly or check out the webinar recording through our homepage, uh, which I will also link at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions for today's webinar, you're also welcome to ask on the questions panel on the right side and I will try to get to as many questions as possible, yet keep this webinar as short as possible. <laughs> All right, um, so here you see on my screen, today I will be talking about the microvisc. I wanna to briefly touch upon the technology that powers our viscometer. I wanna give an overview about the product. I do have some very, very general data and then at the end, I will do a quick live demo. Um, so as many of you could be aware, uh, all of our viscometers that we currently provide are powered by what we call VROC technology. VROC stands for Viscometer Rheometer on a Chip. It's an acronym that we had made for the patented technology. Here on the screen, you'll see how the animated version um, looks or more not really an animated but more cartoon um, you see there's four orange squares so those are the pressure sensors and your sample will actually go ahead and flow in through the inlet on the left side and then it will flow through hit each pressure sensor and then flow out um, so in such cases uh, this is how we're able to get down to the smallest sample volumes. Um, we are able to also control the direct flow of the sample as it's going through. And um, it's pretty much a very miniature version, which I will show you in a second, um, just exactly how small it is um, when it comes to measuring your samples. Uh, before I dive into the microvisc, we do have our full product line, so I just really wanted to touch briefly on each one of them. Um, so starting from the top left, we have the Initium One Plus. This is what I personally call our Rolls Royce. Um, it's fully automated. It does allow you to do 40 samples or 96 samples. Um, right next to it, we have the MVROC 2. So we have the beloved MVROC 1, which was released in 2009. Uh, we do have a quite a loyal fan base and in order for you know to improve the product and take a lot of the suggestions that our end users had given with MVROC 1, we formally released MVROC 2 at the beginning of this year. Um, so here you'll see the shape is quite different from the MVROC 1 um, and we are able to get down to 15 microliters of sample. Sorry there's a small typo in my picture. Um, it is semi-automated and you can technically recycle as well as retrieve your samples. Right next to it, we have the microvisc, which I will go ahead and demonstrate today. And right next to it, we have the MVROC 2S. So this is a sub version of the MVROC 2 that we released towards the end of the year. Um, it does have a little bit more limitation when it comes to the automation. Uh, but you are able to still achieve a lot of the features that you may get from MVROC 2. Below it, we have the EVROC and the HTS. These are highly specialized viscometers, so it comes with <clears throat> sorry, extensional capabilities for the EVROC, and then the HTS, which is a high temperature capabilities for the HTS. 
So high temperature, you can go up to about 105 degrees Celsius in measurements. Uh, right next to it, you'll see the microvisc M. So this is more for the oil industry specific. And so the oil industry works with an ASTM standard and the microvisc M has firmware that will calculate uh, pretty much alongside that standard uh, for our clients in the oil industry. Um, the very last but not least is the VROC chip cleaning station. This one is actually not really a viscometer, um, but it is a supplement to the microvisc or the uh, MVROC 2, um, where you can take the chip once you're done with your measurements and then it will automate the cleaning for you. So um, although maybe some clients prefer the Initium 1 Plus to do all of your measurements and clean, uh, you still can get some of the automated cleaning as well with the MVROC 2 um, and now even the microvisc. So today we will focus on the microvisc. Um, it's a quick, quick and easy, uh, I would say an entry level uh, viscometer to all of our product lines. Our very first end user, which I'm sure every one of you have heard quite often, was uh, seven years old. So it is so easy and simple that you know a non-rheologist or non-specialist can also use. Uh, it weighs roughly about 1.1 pounds, and the minimum sample volume required will be about 100 microliters. Just the microvisc alone is portable, so it comes with a rechargeable battery. You can charge up to, you know, uh, with a full charge, sorry, you can get up to about 100 uh, number, number of 100 samples. <laughs> um, the shear rate range here you can see is 1.7 to 5,800 inverse seconds, and then the viscosity range is roughly about 0.2 to uh, we do say, you know, 20,000 on our website, um, but technically you can go up higher. So 40,000 is what I put here. Um, I have personally also gone up to about 80,000. So it is technically possible to get up to the high viscosity ranges. Um, you do may want to explore other products that we do carry once you get to the really high viscosities, just because if you're interested in controlling the flow, um, it may be beneficial to explore the other options. The temperature range, so this unit alone does not come with the temperature control capabilities on it, but there is a supplemental temperature control accessory that you can add on and it will allow you to control the temperatures between 18 to 50 degrees Celsius. Um, just the microvisc with the VROC chip alone, the VROC chip has a PT1K temperature sensor inside, so it will still give you the temperature readings as you're running at ambient temperature. Um, portability, as mentioned before, yes, it's quite easy to carry around. Uh, a lot of our team members actually carry it on planes. Um, and I, you know, today we actually had an internet outage uh, that started yesterday. So my original plan, if the internet was not coming back, was to go to a nearby Starbucks with the microvis to conduct this webinar. Uh, luckily, we are able to get on. So um, I will spare the the cafe environment uh, for this webinar. <laughs> so before I go into more details, as I mentioned, there are um, the VROC chip will power the microvisc as well. And within the chip options, we actually have a wide variety. So to summarize everything, we have A chip type, we have B chip type and C chip type. Uh, the main differences between A, B and C will be the maximum pressure that each chip can handle. And I'll, I'll explain in just a second why that would be beneficial. And then within the chip uh, options, we also have different flow channel depths. So we have 50 micron, 100 micron, 200 micron, and 300 micron. Um, so within those, uh, what that means is, you know, depending on if your samples have particles or if you're trying to get to a certain shear rate uh, or flow rate, you may want to go with a deeper flow channel. Um, with the particles, we recommend a rule of thumb, which is no particles greater than 10% of the flow channel depth. So if you have a uh, the top one, which is an AO5 chip, the, this means that there, it is a 50 micron flow channel depth chip, and so you can use samples with particles up to about 5 microns. Um, the next step up we have is a 100 micron flow channel, so you can use particles up to about 10 microns. And then the 200 micron flow channel obviously will be 20, and then the 300 micron flow channel will allow particles up to about 30. 
microns. Um, so that's kind of the benefit of having different channel depth. Uh, with the pressure levels, again, the A chips will be ideal for the lower uh, viscosity samples or also the lower flow rates, lower shear rates that you do want to obtain. Um, so as you can see here on my table, the AO5, which is the most popular with our low viscosity samples or you know, customers in our industries of biopharma, biotech, they tend to work with proteins and proteins in general won't go too high um, in comparison to what else, you know, other samples that we may work with, including cannabis samples that are quite higher. Um, and so the AO5 will allow you to measure samples roughly about, it says zero to 100 centipoise here. Um, I would say 0.2 to about 100 centipoise. Uh, it's really beneficial to get um, data when it comes to the low viscosity samples. The far bottom chip here, you see the C30 option. So you can see it can technically go up to about 80,000 centipoise. Um, so this chip would be ideal for extremely high viscosity um, and potential samples that you may want to be able to go to higher flow rates. Oops. Um, so the temperature controller is the optional accessory that I mentioned here. It will allow you to put the microvisc into the blue chamber that you see in the picture. Um, again, you can control the temperature range between 18 to 50 degrees Celsius. It is a Peltier-based uh, temperature function. And then one of my most personal favorite uh, features about the temperature controller is that you can set it up so that the temperature controller can turn on before you arrive in the lab. So that temperature control or temperature stability is already reached by the time you're starting your measurements. Uh, you can also have it scheduled to turn off. So for those who you know just want to have it on for a little bit and then before you leave, make sure that it's just turned off without having to go there, uh, you can also use that feature. Again, it's optional. So as mentioned before, um, each of the VROC chips actually comes with a PT1K sensor inside, which again, I will show you in just a second. Um, the PT1K sensor will then give you the temperature at which you're running. In general, uh, temperature will have a huge impact on viscosity. So we do recommend controlling the temperatures. Um, you know, a good comparison would be with water. If you have water, obviously at lower temperatures, it will freeze, and then water at higher temperatures, it will boil. So you can kind of see, even with samples uh, of all types, you know, the temperature can really change the viscosity. Here's a cartoon version of the microvisc. Um, so it points out each of the components. Where you see the sensor, sensor cartridge, um, it's currently hidden in the picture, but I will show you what it looks like. The VROC chip will actually uh, sit nicely inside. And then we have disposable custom pipettes. So these pipettes are used specifically for the microvisc. Um, you can technically reuse them, but we do recommend, you know, as soon as the barrel does get a bit loose, uh, we recommend replacing them. And again, with the, the capabilities of being disposable, uh, we do have a lot of clients, especially in the hospitals, um, that tend to prefer to throw away their pipettes after being exposed to biofluids. It does come with the LCD display as mentioned, and it will look quite similar to what you see on the temperature controller. So uh, the way that you would control the microvisc is with the display on the microvisc, and then if you put the microvisc inside the temperature control chamber, then you can also control it with a keypad on the top of the temperature controller here. And to use the microvisc, it's quite simple. You can get measurements uh, you know, within less than a minute. You just need to load your sample into the disposable pipette, make sure that it's secured nicely into the VROC chip, and then press run. So some benefits of our technology in general, and also what, what encompasses the microvisc, is that the true viscosity is being measured. Um, you are able to also control the flow rate, uh, which means that you can characterize if your sample is non-Newtonian. And what non-Newtonian means is, you know, depending on your sample behavior, if your sample is exposed to different flow rates, a non-Newtonian sample will impact the viscosity. So the viscosity can change when exposed to different flow rates or shear rates. And if your sample is Newtonian, what that means is no matter what shear rate or flow rate you expose your samples to, the viscosity stays the same. 
um, some two very obvious examples of Newtonian and non-Newtonian samples. Newtonian will be water, and then non-Newtonian, the one that I personally like to talk about is lotion. So if you put hand lotion in between your palms and you rub it, obviously the consistency of the lotion will change. Um, and of course, this is intentional. So uh, this is a good example of what non-Newtonian samples could look like. Small sample size is always going to be a huge uh, benefit when it comes to using all of our viscometers powered by VROC technology. And some of the applications, but not limited to that, a lot of clients will use the microvisc for include biopharma, inks. Uh, we do have where it's legal, of course, uh, medical or cannabis um, research, oil lubricants. We do work with a lot of clients in food and beverages, batteries, cosmetics. And then just in general, I like to throw this in. We do work with a lot of quality control and, you know, QC, QA departments. Um, so these are just some of the data that you can get. We do have quite a number of application notes on our website, so I do recommend going to our website and checking that out um, because you can control the shear rates. You can get true viscosity as a function of shear rate, even with the microvisc. Um, we do have extremely high resolution, so kind of a fun fact, we did work with a lot of wine uh, manufacturers because the resolution uh, or the capabilities of detecting the slightest variations in viscosity is quite important when it comes to the mouth feel um, for the avid wine drinkers. Um, but similar to that, we also measured here, you can see buffer solutions. Uh, the microvisc itself is able to detect even the slightest variation. Um, the last final data set uh, I do want to show is also the capabilities that we can do intrinsic viscosity. Um, you can do intrinsic viscosity with our other product lines, including MVROC2 and Initium 1 Plus, uh, but you can also do it with the microvisc here. All right, um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my camera. So hopefully everyone can see my camera to ensure that my camera is being shown i actually will also share my screen so if it's double um, please feel free to kind of cover one side of it let me see if i can show um, hmm. Okay, it looks like I cannot share my screen at the same time with the webcam. Um, it looks like the webcam is working. If anyone does have trouble, please feel free to put that comment in the question section and I'll make sure to kind of take a pause and just make sure that everyone can see it. Um, but for now, I'm just gonna go ahead and start. So here is the microvisc. Uh, as you can see, it's extremely portable. As mentioned, it's 1.1 one pound, 1 .1 pounds. Um, and I mentioned that I will share the VROC chip. So this is what the VROC chip actually will look like in comparison to the animation. Um, so compared to my hand, uh, it's quite small. And so this is where your sample will actually be introduced. Again, there's three to four pressure sensors inside. So the pressure sensors will detect the change as your sample is being flown through, and then your sample will flow out. Um, although the VROC chips do look like this, we actually enclose all of the VROC chips into ultimately housing. So you won't get a physical VROC chip that looks just like this. This is actually placed inside the housing. Here you see a little red stopper. So this is to prevent any dust from getting into the inlet. But your VROC chip is actually inside uh, right here and the sample is introduced into the inlet and then the sample flows out of this little nozzle here into the outlet. And this is what the back of the VROC chip will actually look like. And then at the bottom you see a little connector. So this is where the microvisc will connect to the chip. 
So on the microvisc here, you see there's a lid. I'm gonna go ahead and take the lid off. I'm gonna hold the microvisc so it's easier for everyone to see. And you go ahead and just push the chip in right here. And that's it. So that's the best way to set up for your samples. Uh, because we went over multiple types of chips, the best way to replace a chip, so let's say you're going from an A chip to a B chip to a C chip, all you have to do is just take out the previous chip and go ahead and put in the new chip. And just make sure that's securely uh, placed in. To turn on the instrument, um, you have a, a little knob here, so you turn it on to the left. And as you can see immediately, the microvisc uh, will start to initialize. Um, some additional features of the microvisc, this is the keypad. This will be where the disposable pipette will be inserted. And then on the right side, this is where you use to charge the microvisc. Again, you can get about 100 measurements in between each full charge. And then in the back, um, I have a waste bottle here. So mine's not the prettiest looking because we do a lot of sample testing here. Um, but you can go ahead and keep it in there. And that's where your sample will actually flow into after your measurements. Um, so what type of accessories come with the micro risk? Um, there's not quite a lot. We do recommend using lint-free wipes and lint-free swabs. Um, so unfortunately, Kim wipes aren't going to be the best when it comes to preventing fibers from being introduced into microfluidic channels. Uh, we do provide a uh, clean room level or similar extremely kind of fine uh, lint-free wipes. And those still technically do generate a little bit of uh, fiber, but we found that that can be significantly uh, reduced in comparison to Kim wipes. So we do recommend um, a different brand of wipes. And then as mentioned a little bit earlier during the presentation, the microvis does come with disposable pipettes. So these will be what it looks like when you first get them. Um, this is the barrel and then this is the plunger. And you can go ahead and just assemble them together. This is how you will actually draw up the sample like this. And each pipette can hold up to about 400 microliters of sample max. And we do advertise, and as a safe rule of thumb, having about 100 microliters of sample per measurement is pretty decent. And you'll get good results with the microvis. So what you can do is go ahead and insert the pipette with the sample into the opening of the chip like this. And I like to push it down with a little bit of satisfaction. You'll hear a click like that. And then you can go ahead and just press run and the instrument will go ahead and start its run. Right now I just have air in it, so it's not going to give you the best readings. But as it's going to start the measurement, I would like to kind of explain a little bit more features. So I'm going to go ahead and put this on my table. And so as we're doing a measurement, um, I did want to mention the microvis does come with three different measurement modes. So the options are auto mode, advanced mode, and cleaning mode. Auto mode, what that will do is the chip will determine the sample viscosity and then run it at roughly about 50% full scale is what we call it. But what that means is it'll run it at about 50% of what the max pressure the chip can handle. Um, if you just need quick and easy viscosity measurements just to confirm a batch is passing, or if you just wanna check the viscosity, um, this is a good measurement method to use. Um, when clients would use advanced would include situations where you wanna determine if your sample is non-Newtonian, so if you want to run it at a specific flow rate or shear rate. And then see, so right now it'll say low scale, obviously because I have air in there, so it's not going to measure anything, um, but it will give you error messages like this in the situation where your sample is not you know, being measured properly. Um, but going back to the advanced mode, you can control the shear rates, you can control flow rate, you can also control the sample volume being used, and you can also control the priming volume being used. Uh, the cleaning mode is the last and final mode. So once you're done with your measurements of sample, it depends on the sample type, but cleaning will be very important when it comes to working with microfluidics. And so you do have to make sure that you're running as a cleaning solution 
Um, similar to a measurement, so you would just load a cleaning solution into a pipette, replace the pipette with your, um, like this, so replace it with a cleaning solution, and then you would just run it in cleaning mode again. Um, when it comes to determining the right cleaning solution, the best one is to work with something that's fully miscible with your sample. So if your sample is water-based and you try to clean it out with oil, it will not work because oil and water obviously do not mix well. Um, but in the case, let's say you are working with proteins, we do recommend trying to clean it out with your buffer um, in which the protein you know, is fully miscible in. And then most majority of the buffers that I have seen are miscible with our cleaning solution that we do commonly recommend called 1% Aquet. Um, and so you can clean it finally with 1% Aquet and leave it in the chip um, to store and then resume for your future measurements. Um, in, if you're not sure how to determine a good cleaning protocol, what I recommend doing is putting your sample and cleaning solution that you are trying to analyze into a clear 20 ml vial and just shake it around. If you see immediate separation or if you see you know, cloudiness, this can indicate that the cleaning will not be done properly. Uh, we do provide another tool called what we call a dummy chip. And so the dummy chips will look very similar to the actual VROC chip here. Um, so you can take a pipette and actually flush your sample through the inlet and then to the outlet, and then again, flush your cleaning solution from the inlet to the outlet just to see how the cleaning could behave if you were to use that. Um, so I do recommend always making sure that your samples are miscible. Again, let's say your sample has a certain percentage of ethanol. Um, some of our clients will then use ethanol to clean uh, after their sample. Um, so it really depends if we do also provide services where we can help with sample testing um, and also determining a cleaning protocol. So if you are interested, you can always reach out to us or your uh, Rio Sense sales rep and they'll be more than happy to help. Some other options that you can do when it comes to um, determining a proper protocol, I would say um, it really depends, but because each chip can handle about 10 microliters of cleaning solution at a time, it should really only take about one or two pipettes really to clean thoroughly. Um, I also like to use the final cleaning run as just a gauge, so the 1% of quite tends to read at about one centipoise at room temperature. So I just like to do a quick auto run with my cleaning solution at the end, just to make sure that it's um, completely cleaned out. In the case that you see your sample viscosity increasing, that can indicate that there's some residue. So what you can do is just stop and go straight to a cleaning run. And most of the time it should help uh, reduce or clean out whatever is kind of accumulating inside your chip. Um, but yeah, as mentioned again, cleaning can be quite important, but when done properly, um, it, you know, as mentioned, we had our first end user who was seven years old. Um, if for any new clients, we do send over the MicroVisc uh, SOP, which is in a Word document format. So you can add your company's logo and additional notes for whatever your team uh, may prefer. Um, but we have a wide variety of resources that you can definitely uh, have access to if you are to move forward, including also, um, we, as mentioned, we do the sample testing and uh, cleaning protocol services as well. All right, um, so without further ado, that was the shortest demo that I have ever really um, hosted. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and now ask questions, and I will go ahead and try to see if I can answer as many as possible. Um, so the first question is, once the microvisc sets the temperature, it me does it mean the sample is uniformly warm? Um, so I kind of want to add a little bit to it. Uh, short answer is yes. And that's really if you are using the temperature control, uh, the chamber that I showed, the blue unit. Um, in those cases, you can control the complete environment of your sample from 18 to 50 degrees. So what the software will do, once you set it at a temperature, the software will then communicate with the microvisc and the temperature controller and make sure that both 
components or both sides are communicating at the same temperature, if that makes sense. Um, if you're not using software, that is totally fine. You can still use just the temperature controller alone with the keypad on top. And so the temperature controller will wait until the stability window for that set temperature um, is complete, and then we'll notify you that it's stable for you to start measuring. So again, short answer is yes, um, it can be uniformly warm, uh, but again, you do have to use a temperature control feature to guarantee that. Um, some clients, you know, we have many clients with different levels of budget, so if they're not always able to purchase a temperature control unit right away, they will try to control their own kind of uh, environment uh, to get a more uniform temperature reading. But as mentioned before, the temperature can quite impact your viscosity, so we do recommend making sure that you have a good source to control the temperature. Um, so it looks like for some people, the camera is still not being shown. Um, in those cases, I apologize for the technical difficulties, uh, but this is fully recorded. So I will make sure that we send you a copy of the webinar, including the recording, uh, which should have the camera uh, details there. Um, to get a dummy chip, you can reach out to your RioSense sales rep. You can also reach out on our website, uh, which then directs to our sales reps. We do also have an online store now where you can uh, purchase, and the online store is directly linked from our website. And either way, if you do have issues locating it or if you have any questions, please uh, click the Contact Us button and just fill out the form, and we'll make sure that someone contacts you right away. Can other chips be removed from their enclosures for cleaning inspection? So yes and no. Um, once you open the VROC chip housing, it does destroy the bonds on the VROC chip. Um, so we don't recommend the end users directly opening up the chip to clean. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't clean the chip successfully. So as mentioned, if you want to run a full cleaning cycle after your measurements, you can go ahead, load a new pipette of cleaning solution, insert it into the inlet of the chip as if you're doing a measurement, and then run it in cleaning mode. Sometimes um, I personally also use advanced mode for the cleaning process. And the reason why is I prefer to flush certain cleaning solutions at a higher flow rate or shear rate, just to kind of give that push um, of the previous sample. So you can technically do a cleaning solution with the other modes, the auto mode, as well as the advanced mode, depending on you know how your sample behaves. I've worked with samples, as mentioned, that can be quite high, up to 80,000 centipoise. And some samples were so thick, like uh, cosmetic mascara, and so in those cases, I do like to run it at a really high flow rate, um, just to kind of, again, push that out. All right. Um, can the microbus be used in a vacuum chamber or a glove box? Yes. Uh, you do have to, please just make sure to specify that in your request on the quote, um, because we do have a special vacuum chamber process that the microvisc um, ultimately we make an edit to the housing and so this is required for it to be compatible with the vacuum chamber all right can acetic acid be used in the machine um, short answer is yes uh, we have many clients who will use that sample but we do recommend after not to store it in acetic acid and just clean it out with something else uh, again, depends on your sample type. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us directly. What we'll do normally is just ask you, you know, what samples are you running? If you are able to share what's in the sample, um, then as mentioned before, we'd kind of give you a cleaning protocol or a cleaning guidance uh, when it comes to cleaning out your sample. But acetic acid in general, yes, it is compatible. It will work. Um, there's really only one solution that won't work with our chips, which is called HF. Uh, and the reason why is because we do have glass inside the VROC chip, so um, HF tends to attract or stick to glass. So that's really the only solution that won't work. 
but we do have clients who are working with you know a variety of acids bases um different types of concentrations when it comes to their samples and majority of the time we have seen that it works if you're not sure again if you can reach out to us we're always happy to kind of customize uh, and tailor our res uh, responses to you and your application all right and if you can see in the um, webcam right now there is a sleep function so this is what the microvisc will then um, turn off it's kind of like putting your computer on standby this is to help preserve your battery, um, but there is a setting where you can choose to turn off this feature. Um, are the glass syringes compatible with the microvisc? So unfortunately, the glass syringes will not be. Um, these disposable pipettes will really be the only ones that you can use with the microvisc. Um, the glass syringes are pretty much for the MVROC2 and also the Initium 1 Plus. Um, so you can reach out to us if you have any questions on those. But for the microvisc, uh, as mentioned, the disposable pipettes will truly be the only consumable that you will need. All right. Um, so what shear rate is default? Um, yes. So it. Short answer is it depends. <laughs> um, it will depend on your sample viscosity and the chip type that you're using. So what auto mode does is it primes the chip a little bit with your sample, and then it it's programmed to determine roughly, you know, hey, we're going to run it at this flow rate or this shear rate, which tends to be around 50% of the chip max pressure. And in order to kind of the terminology that we use is percent full scale. So each chip, we recommend making sure that you're running your sample viscosity within the chip range, of course, and then also your shear rate flow rate, which is within the chip range on pressure. Um, so for the percent full scale, we recommend running it at about minimum 5%, maximum 95% full scale. In general, when you're using auto mode, you don't need to worry about that at all. Um, this is more for clients who are using it in advanced mode and controlling the shear rate flow rate. But in auto mode, what it will do, the instrument will then pick the shear rate or flow rate for you, which is roughly at about 50% full scale. And again, that will depend on your sample viscosity and then the chip type that it's using. So it will vary. Um, if you, let's say, run a sample that's one centipoy, it will have a different flow rate or shear rate at 50% full scale versus a sample that may be running at about 80 centipoise. I hope that makes sense. Um, if it doesn't, please let me know uh, in the questions and I can specify a little bit further. Um, some tips to keep and prolong the pipette life. Uh, this is a really great question. Um, there's nothing specific you really need to do. The only tip that I do recommend is just making sure that you keep the plunger and barrel separate. So when they first arrive in a shipment, they're going to come in two different bags. Um, so I do recommend just keeping them separate and try not to pre-assemble them. That helps kind of keep the barrel at the original um, size. Sometimes if you put the plunger in the barrel and you leave it for months, it can expand the barrel over time. So that's just one of the things. Um, other than that, as mentioned, they're disposable. Some clients who want to reuse them, you're more than welcome to reuse them. We do have a lot of end users who will. Um, but just one tip, if you are reusing them, just make sure that you have some resistance when you're putting in the plunger. Any any moment that you see the plunger being extremely loose, where you know if you're holding the barrel vertically upside down and the plunger just comes out, that's that's a sign or you know it's time to switch to a new pipette. Um, what is the accuracy of the instrument's viscosity value? So we do use a NIST traceable oil uh, in-house when it comes to passing all of our chips during the calibration process. Um, it has to be 2% or uh, less uh, when it comes to accuracy. As mentioned, these are NIST traceable oil standards, so we do like to use those. <clears throat> Excuse me. We do have a lot of clients who will 
um, purchase the same calibration fluid, so you can always reach out to us and contact us uh, to determine exactly which oil we use per chip type. Uh, and we can give you that as a quote um, and supply the item. We do have oil-based and water-based standards um, that are both NIST traceable, so you can use both options depending on for water-based calibration fluid, a lot of our clients who are working with water-based samples prefer this option, so it's easier to clean. I do wanna say though, the oil-based, which is also why we use oil-based in-house, is that the lifespan of the oil-based standards tend to be quite longer. Um, over time, when you're dealing with the water-based calibration fluids, you'll see the viscosity start to increase, and what that indicates is that the water is evaporating in the standard. Um, anytime you see the, the viscosity increasing, what most of our clients who use a water-based standards will do then is just replace it with a new one. Um, and most of the time that tends to solve the increase in viscosity. <clears throat> All right. So should every sensor be calibrated again? Um, I'm not quite certain on this question, but I'll touch base on it in a couple different ways. Um, you don't need to calibrate it every time you're running the sample or you're running your measurements. As long as you're cleaning and taking care of the chips properly, you should be able to resume your measurements the next time. So here in-house, we do a lot of client um, sample testing as well as research for all of our technical application notes that we release. Um, so we have different end users using the same types of chips. Obviously, the more end users you have, it can get a little bit difficult to control. So for some of our clients, especially in the biopharma industry, some of them tend to have 80, you know, 70 to 80 users. Uh, so we recommend keeping a log of how, you know, what was last flushed and how to clean it. Um, again, if properly taken care of, you should be able to just go ahead and start your next set of measurements. If you need to validate or provide proof that your measurements are accurate, then we do recommend running the NIST traceable water-based or oil-based standard first, confirming that it's accurate and then running straight to your measurements. Um, so it really depends on the environment um, that you're working in. Uh, some, com some companies are extremely strict when it comes to, you know, just compliance and just making sure that they have all of their proof that they're really uh, keeping track of their measurements. So in those, in such cases, um, or you know, GMP settings, you may wanna do that route. And then in some other locations, you know, especially in, I would say universities, they're not quite as strict because they're heavily focused on just research. And so in those cases, again, as long as you're making sure that everything's properly taken care of, um, you should be able to go straight into um, your measurements. Overall maintenance, so uh, we recommend recalibrating or replacing your VROC chips once a year. And this is the heart of your instrument, as you're aware, the sample will flow through the VROC chips. So we do recommend making sure that your chip is always serviced uh, at least once a year. And then the microvisc itself, so if you see on my screen here, you can see there is on the right a calibration sticker. So obviously this one's outdated. This is just my internal demo unit that I like to use. Um, to just show clients. And so um, all new microvisks and serviced microvisks will come with a calibration sticker. This duration, the due date use, is usually about a year as well. Um, for clients who are in GMP settings or extremely strict settings, we can provide microvisk calibrations. And all calibrations come with a new certificate. But if you're really trying to decide what to get serviced, I would definitely and strongly make sure that the chip is always within um, the service range. So when testing multiple samples, do you typically clean between each sample or just at, at the end of the day? Um, I have multiple answers to this. Short answer is if it's completely missable, let's say it's, different concentrations of the same sample, you technically do not need to clean in between. Um, one tip when it comes to working with different concentrations of sample, if you go from high concentration to low, it helps alleviate the cleaning process because you're going from the more viscous sample to the low viscosity sample. Um, so that's just one tip that I personally recommend. If your sample, let's say, is water-based and then you have to go to another oil-based sample, 
you do need to clean in between to just make sure that your previous sample is fully flushed out. Um, so it really depends on what your measurements entail. Again, if you're not sure and if you have any questions, you can always reach out to us. Um, just go to our website, www.riosense.com. On the top right, it should say contact us. So you can click on that and just submit a form. Um, or if you do have uh, a Rio Sun sales rep contact, uh, you can always reach out to them as well. As mentioned, all of our, our, our team is extremely happy to help. So I noticed the temperature reading is 21.25 degrees Celsius during my demo. Uh, how, how accurate is the measurement? So we are actually implementing this. So I kind of wanted to show off a little bit. Um, the temperature sensor itself will be plus or minus 0 0.07 degrees Celsius uh, when it comes to accuracy, but we will start to incorporate that into the certificates. We do have a lot of clients in GMP settings who are starting to ask for this. So uh, we are going to implement this in 2024. Does the temperature change much through the measurement um, through the four pressure sensors? So I would say no. Um, even at ambient temperature, I've seen that the temperature can be quite stable. But again, it really depends on where you're working. Um, sometimes when we do demos in Japan, some of the labs can be extremely hot. And so you can see fluctuations. It really depends on your lab environment. Um, if your microvisc is next to a fan or another instrument that's blowing air, which I have personally seen, it is possible for the temperature to fluctuate extremely. Um, and in those cases, I do recommend making sure that you have the temperature control chamber just to really make sure that you have a uh, controlled environment when it comes to during your measurements. Um, if the temperature varies, will it impact your micro risk? It won't damage it at all in any shape or form, but you will get weird readings. You know, like the first one could be at 21.4 degrees Celsius and the next one could be at 25 degrees Celsius. So um, it may not be the best when it comes to your data analysis. Like it might not always be apples to apples. What's the difference for the MicroVisc M models for oils? Um, yes, so the MicroVisc and the MicroVisc M will look exactly the same. Uh, MicroVisc M was actually developed at a later time due to a request from one of our uh, oil clients. And so uh, in the oil industry, ASTM is a standard. Of course, I know other industries as well do follow ASTM, but when it comes to oil industry, it is quite, you know, it is the standard. And so we have uh, ASTM standard D445, I believe. I have to double check that, but we do have an app note where it shows the full correlation and how the instrument will calculate everything. Um, but following the ASTM D445, the MicroVisc M just has different firmware. Um, so what you need to do when you first start using the MicroVisc M is you do have to put in the oil readings that your supplier or vendor will give you at 40 degrees and 100 degrees. Um, and then it will run the measurement at the ambient temperature or at the room temperature that it's supposed to be measuring at. And then it will give you the calculations so that you can apply those values, uh, again, through ASTM D445 for your application. Um, MicroVisc M is very specific just to the oil industry at this moment. But some examples we do have, you know, the Korean Navy has about seven on, on their ships. Uh, so they do use it quite often. We have other oil refineries that will use it. Um, it is possible to also use the regular MicroVisc in oil applications and oil industries as well. We have, you know, Philips 66 or ExxonMobil who do have the MicroVisc uh, just to run their samples. Um, we have Chevron that works with oil as well, but they are more in the R&D location when it comes to Richmond, California. And so they have our previous version of the MVROC, which is now MVROC 2. So it really depends on what you're looking for, how it could suit your needs. Um, but all of our, I guarantee you, all of our viscometer options can cover, um, if not cover most of what you're, you're, you're needing to look for or what you need to get. Um, it is also another cheaper alternative when it comes to uh, exploring other options like a rheometer. Um, rheometers are great uh, and it's just, you know, we're not really competing with a rheometer, but some of our clients who don't need all of the capabilities of a rheometer will come to our options because you can still get viscosity as a function of shear rate or viscosity as a function of temperature. Um, mind you, we have a lot of clients who use both instruments, so it can just be a good um, kind of 
you know, supplemental piece. Um, but as mentioned, it really depends on what you're working with and what you're looking for. Can you run multiple tests on the microvisc? Yes. Um, so each pipette can hold up to about 400 microliters. That should roughly give you at least three, three to four runs, depending on your sample viscosity. Um, and if you're using it in auto mode or advanced mode, um, I would say, you know, if you're trying to see how accurate your results are, I recommend running it about two to three times. Um, I'm a little bit more paranoid because I was always taught to be very careful in the lab. So I actually run it three times just to show how repeatable it is. And that's one of the benefits when it comes to the microvisc as well, but all of our other products, because the repeatability is what's so important when it comes to intrinsic viscosity. Um, so you're going to really be able to achieve that when it comes to running measurements with not just the microvisc, but the microvisc, MVROC2, and Initium 1+. So if it measures 26 microliters and you load 100 microliters, is the result reproducible? Um, this is a great question. Yes, uh, there is a priming step in the first run, so it takes a little bit more sample. But um, once, you know, if it's measuring 26 microliters, obviously you have way more in your pipette, especially if you loaded 100 microliters. We do advertise that you need a minimum of 100 microliters, but sometimes you don't need to have 100 microliters for each measurement. It can actually go down to, you know, I've had a sample where I was working with a client in DNA, uh, DNA application, and we had to use the advanced mode because they only had 26 microliters of sample. So once you get comfortable with the microvis, this is what I always personally recommend. Don't use advanced mode right away. Just kind of use auto mode, get comfortable. Um, once you get to a level of confidence or, you know, I jokingly say cockiness, then you can go ahead and try the advanced mode and you can kind of play around with the measurement volume, the cleaning volume, uh, sorry, priming volume, and then also the shear rates, flow rates that you need. But technically you can go down to less than 100 microliters. How do you guarantee that the chip is clean thoroughly? So I kind of briefly touched upon this, but um, again, I always recommend just doing a miscibility test first. Always make sure that your samples are completely miscible. Um, we work with a wide variety of brilliant people and you know, people are extremely busy. Sometimes they don't recognize that you know, water and oil are not miscible and I've seen some clients who will run them doesn't always mean, um, you know, it's just a very honest mistake. I do think that if you can really spend a little bit of time at the beginning when you first get the instrument to clean or check the cleaning solution and compatibility, either through a dummy chip or as mentioned, the 20 ml vial method, um, it will really save a lot of time, especially if you wanna put that into the SOP template and then train the rest of your team. Um, one thing that I personally like to guarantee, so let's say I'm running protein and after I ran buffer and 1% a quet, 1% a quet, again, should be at about one centipoise at room temperature. And so what that allows you to do is you can kind of do a quick check. Oh, okay, like the cleaning solution is reading properly and I should uh, be pretty much set to go for the next time. If you're extremely careful or you have to produce kind of a proof that you have fully cleaned it, you can also run a calibration standard at the end of your runs just to make sure um, that it's properly cleaned. And then as long as the calibration oil is reading within the 2% accuracy, then you should be well within uh, the range and confirm that it is okay to continue to use the chip. Um, should I buy multiple chips? Short answer is yes. Uh, the first the first recommendation is I always recommend having a backup to your chip just in case, especially if you have 70 to 80 users. Um, you don't know what some people might be running one day and you don't want to be down uh, if you know your only chip is needs servicing or calibration. So I always recommend having a backup chip. Um, if you're working with a wide variety of samples, let's say we have clients who are in, you know, CROs or they're consulting for other firms that might be working with all types of samples, 
then I do recommend making sure that you have one chip uh, suitable for the low viscosity, usually the AO5, and then another chip that can be better for the higher viscosities. Um, some customers will like to get the B10 chip, which you can go up to a couple thousand centipoise, or even higher, which you know the highest one was a C30. Technically, you can go, you can go up to about 80,000 centipoise. So uh, it really depends on your application. Um, again, just having a backup is always good. Uh, this is more of my mentality that I learned when you know being involved in production. Um, just making sure that there's no downtime is probably a big goal uh, of my personal, <laughs> of mine personally. So um, I always recommend having a backup chip at least. Um, what if I'm getting different results from auto mode and advanced mode? That would be really interesting. Um, if it's possible, I would like you to send me the data. Um, it would be really nice for me to analyze. What I recommend, just how, how to approach that, I recommend checking your R squared values first. Um, just make sure that the R squared values are between 0 0.996 to about one. Um, so the R squared value is something that each measurement will give you, and this will indicate how stable your measurement is. If you have a bubble in the pipette um, or a bubble in your sample as it's being introduced into the chip, um, I know some other lab equipment in general, if you in introduce a bubble, uh, it can damage the consumable or the VROC chip. For us, it does not damage the VROC chip. So um, you can insert a bubble. The only thing when it comes to having bubbles in your sample is that your readings will show that there was a bubble in it through the viscosity range being strange or the R squared value. It can show up instead of 0.996 to 1, it might show up as 0.4. Um, sometimes I've seen negative viscosity values when I have a huge bubble in my uh, sample. So those are just some indicators. So I would check the R squared values first. Just make sure that it truly um, is a stable measurement. And then if you can send me the data that has, you know, the same percent full scale, but different viscosities, I would love to take a look. Um, some instances where I've seen, you know, the percent full scale is similar, but the viscosity changes would be if your sample is extremely non-Newtonian um, or slightly, you know, I don't know if you if you're familiar with the terms shear thinning or shear thickening. So depending on your sample type, some samples will behave in a very extreme manner. It can change in viscosity for even the slightest change in pressure, um, and some some samples will be less prone to changes. So it really depends. I can have a true rheologist take a look. Um, that's really probably above my specialty, but. Uh, I can definitely have them take a look. So if you want to go ahead and just fill out a contact us form and send me the data, um, you're more than welcome to. I'd be extremely happy to take a look at that. Um, and then thank you everyone for such great words. Um, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate everyone's time as well, uh, especially again, as mentioned, um, clients overseas just for the time, and then also clients in the US just prior to right before vacation. Um, so I really want to thank you. All right. Um, so it looks like I went through most of the questions. Um, there's a couple, like the questions keep kind of overlapping. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'll go ahead and conclude the webinar. Um, again, thank you everyone so much for joining. Um, any questions that I was not able to answer, I will make sure that me and my team get back to everyone. Um, and we'll make sure that you know each of your questions are answered. Um, if you have new questions as well, you're welcome to add it to the chat right now uh, or also go to our website, www.riosense.com. On the top right, click Contact Us and you can submit a form. Um, some things that are coming up next month, December, we will have a holiday special for our webinar. So please, uh, if you can, join us for that. Uh, we will record it as well, so that's um, something to look forward to. We do have a bunch of application notes and uh, previous webinar recordings as well. Our our R&D team works extremely hard to gather a lot of the data, so we recommend you know going to our website and just exploring, taking a look. There's literally we have hundreds of application notes that you know, uh, many customers are even citing in their papers these days. So uh, really take a look if you have time. Um, we also have a publications list. So if you want to see all of the papers that our end users are publishing with the technology, feel free to take a look again on our website. 
And then follow us on our uh, social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, and if you have any suggestions, you're always welcome to let us know. Uh, it, our R&D team would really like a lot of submissions when it comes to application ideas so that we can continue to grow our content and also help uh, your personalized work uh, at the same time. All right, so um, thank you so much for your time today uh, and have a great rest of your week. Happy Thanksgiving, happy holidays for everyone. And thank you.